Thank you, Rahul. On behalf of all organizers, we welcome you all to join the sixth and last session of the Win Watson webinar series. I am Shanti, I am Shanti Menon from Win Foundation, and I look after projects, outreach, and programs. This series is jointly organized by some of the leading institutions and social organizations in this domain, like IIT Kharagpur, Arik Communities and Technology. Center for Water and Sanitation, Step University, IIT Bombay, IIT Gandhinagar, and Wing Foundation. Today's session is conducted by Wing Foundation on the topic Empowering Communities Through Innovation for Sustainable Social Impact. The first presenter of the session is Mr. Parish Ora, Director, India Operations, Wing Foundation, followed by Professor Chandra Mohan Subramanian, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, IIT Bombay. Then we have three exciting social impact startups: Aikin Robotics from IIT Madras, Austin Technology from Jaipur, and Proctor Solutions from Pune. They will talk about their innovations and the difference they aim to make. The session will continue to have community user voice, represented by our two community partners, Mr. Siraj Sirani, Program Management Specialist from Manila Housing Seva Trust, and Dr. Yogesh Jadeja. Director, Arik Committees and Technologies. Please feel free to post your questions and answers under QA box. We will try to address all relevant questions during our QA session. We are pleased to have Mr. Ram Mehta, Executive Director, Win Foundation, based at US. He will briefly talk about Win Foundation and he will also introduce our main speakers of the session. Over to you, Ron. Thank you very much, Shanti. Uh, it is a real pleasure to uh, join this conversation, this webinar. A little brief introduction about WIN Foundation. WIN stands for Wheels India Niswarth Foundation, and it is basically a US nonprofit that was started by a very generous $2 million donation from a philanthropist. Uh, Mr. Chirag Patel and his family, Chirag and his family own a company called Amnil Pharmaceuticals in the US and also in India. The main purpose of WIN, the vision of WIN is to support innovations in water and sanitation or what we would short form call WATSAN and in maternal and child health, MCH, to improve the daily lives of the poorest of the poor in our Indian society and develop innovations, support innovations to that are sustainable and stable. The first presenter today is Mr. Paresh Vora. Paresh is the director of our Win India operations, and he has worked in diverse technology industries for over 28 years. Like me, he is an alumni of IIT Bombay and uh, did his advanced management at IIM Ahmedabad. He has worked for over 28 years in diverse technology industries, including computer software and hardware, telecom technology, and diverse engineering domains. His top management roles included being the managing director of Dover India at Bridgeline Software and country manager for Epson India. He then worked for seven years in higher education, including heading up Team Lease Skills University in Gujarat, and also uh, was he was the first president there, followed by a role at Ahmedabad University, where he headed uh, quality assurance and technology startup incubation. Over to you, Paresh. Thank you, Ron, and I'll just uh, share my screen also. Yeah, is my screen visible? Yeah, I'll start with the presentation and uh, I'll quickly run through it because today's session is about startups. And so, and our some innovations at grassroots and what has been our experiences, though I think it is the experiences of startups which will be more important for us. Uh, Ron already actually went through this aspect about win vision that uh, our vision is to support 
innovations in water and sanitation, maternal and child health. Uh, and one of the things we have realized and we do very strongly is to build collaborations among diverse stakeholders. And let me go to the next slide. Uh, and this is what we mean by a multi-stakeholder approach in terms of building collaborations. You see on the left side, we see the uh, actually the service provide various kinds of people who bring different talents and services in, which uh, include say uh, institutions, education institutions, which bring R&D and also a student force. And also, I mean, R&D also means that the faculty expert faculty involved. Then we have NGOs, non-government or I mean, no, yeah, non-government, non-profit organizations who bring domain, community program, community connect and programs and startups. I don't need to tell what startups bring. They bring innovation in product and business models and they bring a strong entrepreneurship drive. On the right side, you see government. Of course, government also plays important role in social sphere. Uh, as our role, we see grassroots, we provide grassroots project support, we support innovation support programs, we support collaborations. And there are other in players, industry bodies, industry CSR arms, investors, independent professionals. And you see the center fo the focus of all these is community needs and the action and outcome being aimed at are improved quality of life, improved livelihood. Uh, we also look at knowledge management so that the processes can be codified, replicated, and so transformation occurs in the society. So bringing together all these different collaborators to bring the transformation amongst communities for sustainable impact. Uh, with this, uh, we move to uh, social impact innovations, need and challenges. I just want to take a minute or two to cover what's important there. Uh, there is a huge need for social impact I mean, innovations in almost every sphere of uh, social uh, social aspect, whether it is water, energy, etc. And this is to improve quality of daily life and livelihoods, and particularly for the underprivileged or the poor, whether in tribal, rural, or you know, rural and uh, urban slums. And uh, the way to also look at it and, and from a startup perspective, it is very important that this is actually a huge market potential, which is only similar to FMCG goods, whether in water harvesting, water purification, toilets, etc. The market itself is huge and similar to FMCG. That is the point we want to make. And the customers and even the poor customers, poor or lower middle class, they're actually currently paying a very, paying a price, a, a very often a very heavy price in financial as well as non-financial for poor services and products. And what is sometimes called as free is often very expensive for them. Some of our, our uh, NGO partners, when they return, maybe they will also amplify that, that the customers pay a lot of price for water, financially as well as otherwise, in terms of poor water and similarly poor sanitation services or insufficient energy services. And so there is a key role for both non-profit and for-profit social startups. So if the, if we say, if we claim that there is a huge market potential, then what are, why doesn't it happen? Then why doesn't, why doesn't the companies or startups gain easy, you know, customer base and grow? And I think the problems and challenges have to be recognized that there is a lack of knowledge and trust amongst the customers. And these are the customers very often at the bottom of the pyramid, the rural poor, the urban slums, dwellers, the communities there, and they do not know about the product. They can't trust people coming and they might have been fooled many times. And also lack of effective reach of sellers to introduce and sell those products. It is not a straightforward reach where you have ready-made outlets or ready-made distribution channels. So those things have to be thought through and created. And the key requirement there we feel through our experiences is a market introduction process which has to bring behavior change and a lot of skilling also has to be done and this has to bring a transformation in the way they handle products the way they use them and this is what will unleash that huge market potential uh, and the strategy which we have thought is key is partnerships uh, it's key to bring the above change and that is education and also along with it education and skilling a lot of trials and perseverance. The word trial looks so simple, but very often we are afraid of trialing things. 
the society is also you know look wants everything tried and tested but there is nothing tried and tested when something is new all of us know that now uh, with that we come to what is win support programs uh, one of them and we have partners here who, who will uh, tell about their products which we have supported so we have a win innovative product market validation support and this supports uh, startups and the critical prototype test refine stage this, this is a stage which defines the product it tests out the market it also enables the communities in this case to use the product and experience them remember for this many of these communities the first time they're using something and gaining confidence over using something new and our support is in terms of partnership with ngos which connects to user communities for usage and feedback through the right kind of user community introduced in the right manner with proper education and connect and this means try and we we also support the trial product installation and training cost for this process uh, and the main objective for this is uh, both social and market objective in our view because they are very in our view they are all interlinked unless we create a market nothing is sustainable so bring science to society uh, to improve quality of life and livelihoods both so both the livelihood the way people work they improve that uh, their quality of life also the daily life and then bring society to science that is to inculcate, inculcate scientific attitude curiosity and trials for new products new business models new way of doing things new habits and this is where they should have that curiosity and try and of course sometimes there may be trials may not succeed but they should not worry they should just maybe just bury that trial do something else but uh, not be afraid of something new uh, we have supported a uh, number of startups in the last 6 7 months in which we have activated this in watson we have so far supported four startups i have listed them here some of them are presenting ffem cf partech i have also listed the partner whom we are supporting because that linkage with partner is extremely important so ffem cf partech and soil sense through act and samarth Austin technology through MHT. Uh, we also have maternal and child health. I will not talk about them because this is about water and sanitation webinar. But there also we have uh, supported a few startups through other foundations and partners. And we welcome more startups to apply. Our website winfoundations.org has details and a simple form to apply. Uh, we also participate together in other startup programs. One of the major one being the National Bio Entrepreneurship Competition (NBEC), which is organized by CCAMP on behalf of that Department of Biotechnology, their arm called BIREC. And Win is a partner last year and has been a partner last year and this year too in two our two domains. Uh, and in NBEC 2019, we had winners. Uh, Watson was Alchemy Robotic Septic Tank Cleaning System. Uh, Professor Prabhu from there will be presenting on that. Uh, in MCH, we had Black Frog, which was a portable refrigerated vaccine carrier box. And one interesting I, uh, thing I will mention is that currently it is also being used to carry COVID-19, COVID test samples back to the lab at a controlled temperature. And uh, NBEC 2020 is ongoing and their application deadline just got extended to 11th October. So those of you who are startups listening to this and if you can apply, please do. It's an exciting uh, competition completely online with excellent partners. We also partner with other social accelerators whenever possible in many ways. I've just mentioned two major ones with whom we very often dialogue and you know exchange startups to see how we can help them. One is Social Alpha. Social Alpha is a very well-known uh, social ex uh, impact accelerator sponsored by Tata Trust. Another one is Aspire Labs based in Delhi, which is sponsored by Polyplex Industries. And we also welcome other partnership. We do work with others. Uh, this I didn't want to crowd out crowd this uh, presentation too much with too many names. But anyway, these are this is the kind of list of our partners. You see, NGO and institution partners includes a number of IITs, number of other organ so social organizations, and uh, the startup or startup support organizations like C Camp, Aspire, and then we have, we have listed startups and also ecosystem and outreach partner. 
uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation and uh, thank you for listening to me but the more exciting part listening to the startup will just come now over to you ron back thank you very much paresh it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the next speaker dr chandramouli subramaniam subu to most of us he is associate professor in the department of chemistry at iit bombay he did his msc and phd at iit madras he was a postdoc researcher and then partner researcher at the national institute of advanced industrial science and technology in japan he has worked extensively and he is a prolific researcher who has effectively used single wall carbon nanotubes for very diverse applications such as wearable and washable sensors but more important to us is in the development of a unique water treatment technology which he has nicknamed as chakra actually stands for capacitive deionization which provides a cost effective alternative to reverse osmosis over to you subu yeah thank you um, ron uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction and uh, uh, for the opportunity to share uh, what i've been doing as a part of uh, uh, activities covered by win foundation so uh, the next uh, 10 minutes or so i'll try to briefly capture the essence of what uh, we have been trying to do in this area of uh, water purification especially uh, in the context of uh, desalination of water and i call it as a bottom up approach uh, the reason i'll uh, will become probably clear to you as i go along the uh, course of my talk uh, so the, we are uh, actually driven by this uh, uh, when i say bottom up approach this is exactly what uh, uh, mahatma gandhi had in his talisman that uh, whatever work we do has to reach the grassroots level so uh, what we uh, what i thought we should do is start rather from the grassroots level instead of a top down approach we uh, i am trying to adopt a bottom up approach where we start from the grassroots and then eventually come out with or uh, 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 kind of grow the technology from a bottom up approach and um, so uh, in the context of what we are trying to do uh, this is a kind of an uh, map of india uh, which is uh, geographical not only geographical but also uh, uh, coded in terms of color coded in terms of water stress areas and if you see this nearly more than half of the geographical area uh, falls under this category of high to extremely high water stressed regions so it's not uh, and if you look at it little closely it is not really due to the availability of water but rather due to the availability of good portable water portable quality water and one of the major roadblocks in realizing this has been the salinity of uh, ground gr indian ground water so the salinity can come from various uh, sources it can come from overuse of fertilizers it can come from industrialization and uh, for uh, uh, for the coastal regions along the coastal regions um, the salinity does come from come in from the sea water sources so uh, how do we uh, so it's uh, the question can be kind of uh, uh, addressed by if it were to try to develop uh, a method or a, a uh, uh, approach which can um, uh, do do away with the salinity or the total dissolved salt content in in groundwater now uh, ro or reverse osmosis has been the most prominent technology and most widespread technology um, israel has been a, a world leader in uh, employing this technology to generate uh, portable water for itself but when you when it comes to an indian scenario we will have to we have uh, besides the technological aspects we do have other problems to deal with most important from the context of an ro being its energy intensive and capital intensive uh, process and more so from a, a, a different viewpoint uh, uh, what ro does is it basically waste nearly 40% of the water it treats so suppose if you were to get for 600 ml of water 
uh, from a liter of uh, say uh, salt water 600 ml of potable water the remaining 400 ml and this is a conservative estimate this 40 percent is a very conservative estimate is simply wasted it is not available for use and in fact it is fee fed back into the groundwater make uh, groundwater uh, table and making the groundwater even more salty and even more saline so this is kind of a vicious cycle which we want to kind of avoid and that is where we uh, came across across this uh, technology or uh, uh, called capacitive deionization it's a very uh, fundamentally it's very simple uh, what it does is you you take two electrodes or two metallic sheets apply a voltage across this one is positive in polarity another is negative in polarity and you start feeding in saline water from one end of it so as the water containing the dissolved salts moves through this through these uh, plates metallic plates which are charged uh, by an external battery or an external uh, potential uh, what happens is that these salts get um, uh, accumulated on these electrode surfaces so uh, because the purely because of the electrostatic forces of attraction and then but the water uh, is uh, not Im uh, is kind of immune to this polarity and so most of the water goes through and at the end of it what you get is sometimes deionized water or uh, water containing lesser amount or lesser concentration of dissolved salts so can uh, what we thought was starting from this viewpoint we asked the question can we develop a portable and efficient desalination uh, device using this capacitive deionization approach so for that the important parameters that we were wanted to uh, that we have to consider are two two major parameters one is called the electrosorption capacity which basically quantifies per weight of your electrode the electrode material that you have here per weight of the electrode material that is that you employ how much uh, how much of uh, how much amount of salt can you take out from water and the other parameter is basically called salt adsorption rate which talks about the kinetics of the entire process meaning that how fast can you remove these water uh, the, these ions from the water so both of this are very important parameters one talks about the amount of salt that you can resolve uh, that you can remove from the water source and the other is how fast can you do this entire process and both of it is uh, both of these parameters are important when it comes to real time applications so uh, when we looked at uh, the the landscape the canvas of uh, materials existing we saw that most of this uh, the, the black dots is what we were uh, uh, we found in literature and patent uh, databases so we see that as we go higher in feedstock concentration the the number of data points which can give us very high electrosorption capacity that means a high uh, ability to remove uh, salts uh, dissolved salts from water actually decreases and this space uh, uh, becomes lower and lower and so we wanted to kind of cover this and that is exactly what we tried what we have achieved so if you look at these uh, stars these are our data points where we can um, uh, get, get Bo treat both high concentrations of salt solutions or saline solutions high concentrations of feedstock and not only that we can do it with high electrosorption capacity at high enough is asar or the adsorption rates so now to give you a brief idea of what we use like um, like um, ron said um, we are we um, our lab works on this material major part of our activity is focused on this material called single wall carbon nanotubes which we grow in our lab this is how they look at a you uh, know in, in a photograph but when you were to look at it at the atomic atomistic scale this is basically a layer of sp2 arranged carbon atoms which are uh, sp2 carbon carbon atoms which are arranged in the form of cylinder so these are hollow cylinders which have huge surface area uh, that is uh, nearly 1000 meter square per gram and are also electrically conductive now the, just to give you an idea if i uh, this one um, so this is a photograph of a 2 by 2 cm substrate uh, on which this for this nanotubes are being grown so this black material that you see here is the uh, are the carbon nanotubes and uh, if you have about 1 gram of this material it it's good enough to cover almost uh, uh, the area of uh, two tennis courts so that's the amount of material and that's the mass of the material that can translate from a simple lab scale synthesis 
and uh, so what we did was we took this black powder and converted it into because this powder is a very difficult form to work with so what we did was we uh, converted it into a aqueous solution or, or aqueous uh, dispersion i would say which we call it as a cnt ink and it is exactly like what an ink would ink would do so what do you do with an ink you can paint or you can coat it on a variety of substrates so in this case what we did was we coated it with on on a cellulose uh, uh, fiber or a cellulose yarn which is basically the same uh, piece of thread which you which makes your textiles it's a cotton uh, thread which makes it makes up your textiles and fabrics so what we we through a process of dip coating which is now kind of, uh, now automated we can actually coat it and the end result of it is that you get a very uniform coating of these carbon nanotubes on this uh, cellulose matrix and this makes it not only electrically conductive because the nanotubes themselves are electrically conductive so the 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 entire thread now becomes an electrical conductor as you can see from this uh, iv uh, uh, graph the current versus voltage initially it was a flat line uh, parallel to the x axis which means that it's an insulator and as you code, uh, put the, uh, the take it through these various steps uh, it it becomes a, a, a very nice electrical conductor and not only that you have a high surface area remember the surface area of the nanotubes or of any nanomaterial is very important for its application so when we we uh, uh, took this uh, CNT thread and because this is made through such an easy route, you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, so what we did was we just started using this as a piece of copper, just like how a piece of copper wire would be used. You take it and wind it up just like how you do for a winding of a motor and then you as you try to assemble this into a parallel plate capacitor so that you apply a volt uh, 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 potential create a potential difference between these two electrodes and the cnt thread uh, cnts which are there on this are going to feel that uh, feel the action of the electric field and thereby you also create a channel through which you send in the saline water and all the ions are should be theoretically absorbed on onto the walls of this uh, CNT thread and the what comes out should be pure water or at least water of lower saline concept or lower salinity and uh, the entire device what we real uh, what we could realize is that entire device could be powered with a single uh, uh, battery it's, its power consumption is really very low so that's the advantage of using nanomaterials so but this form of a device we were not really happy with this form factor of the device because here uh, if you see water has to be pushed through the channel and uh, uh, for the pure water to come out and it has to be basically squeezed into the channel uh, before the before you start getting pure water at the other end of the channel that's something which we wanted to work on and if you see most of our uh, water uh, purification devices be it the the dormant uh, non electrically powered non uh, dormant uh, candle kind of a uh, water filter or the the aqua aqua guard kind of a reverse osmosis filter or a reverse osmosis membrane uh, by itself every single device that exists in the market is the 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 the, the purification chamber uh, chamber is constant and water is actually forced through that so you have the membrane the membrane is constant and the water actually goes is forced through that leading to uh, some kind of filtration but now we wanted to kind of invert this entire geometry because the the the, the versatility because we are able to do it on a very if a, pla, a very uh, unique platform such as a cellulose thread we can play around and th this gives us a lot more possibilities and combinations through which we can innovate so now we ask the question why should always water flow through the active material or the membrane or the filtration uh, uh, filtration channel why not the other way so what we did was we made this that is where this chakra came into existence so this is basically a copper ring into which you make the spokes of the uh, these spokes of the copper ring the wheel that you see these are made with the cnt coated uh, cellulose yarns cellulose threads 
and uh, now you assemble two such devices and then this plays exactly the same role as a parallel plate capacitor so you can apply a, a voltage between these two such rings and then these threads because they are electrically conductive are going to get polarized and pull in and uh, uh, electrostatically capture the salt uh, the, the the salt ions uh, which are present in the water. Now the advantage of this process is that there is nothing for the water to flow through. Rather, this device which is uh, shown here in the SM fully assembled form can actually go inside a bucket of water. So it's not, it, we, we kind of, uh, through this, we have kind of inverted the entire geometry. It's no longer water flowing through the membrane, but the membrane going through the water. So you put this entire uh, device into a bucket of water, which is about five liters. We have tested all, uh, all our tests are run with five liter batches and you put this swirl it around gently while all the time applying a potential difference created with a battery with a normal a double A or a triple A battery. And then uh, you get and as the, uh, the device um, uh, meets the water interface, the water interface keeps changing and thereby absorbs all the ions, uh, all the salts, uh, most of the salt in the solution and uh, then you can remove it and wash it. So now uh, using this, what we have been able to do uh, achieve is up to 90% TDS removal and uh, uh, and this removal uh, between 85 to 90% of TDS removal, that is the uh, removal in the total uh, dissolved salt content of the feedstock water. And uh, we have also been able to repeat this or uh, reuse this for more than uh, 100 cycles. Although the data what is shown here is up to 100 cycles, we have gone even sometimes we have reached even up to 250 cycles of constant re uh, reuse. So this and the, the best thing about it is because it's a purely electrostatically driven phenomena, it, it mean not it is not uh, sensitive to the type of ions present in the water. It can act with sodium, potassium, magnesium and calcium, magnesium and calcium being the major contributors of hard hardness in water, but it can also act for anions such as chloride, sulfates and the dangerous fluoride as well. So you take in a feedstock. So for example, uh, you take in a feedstock of 2000 ppm, you, you get a removal efficiency of more than 85 uh, percent. Uh, for about uh, more than 100 cycles and the most important thing that we realize is that it is all done with a battery and with a water wastage of less than 5%. So you end up wasting a very little amount of water compared to what you eventually uh, you you encounter in uh, in uh, reverse osmosis kind of technologies. So that's a key point because uh, although we might not realize this because we are not paying for water uh, per liter but once we might get into a situation and we need to respect the the uh, availability of water around us and that means we need to conserve and uh, uh, use as little as possible or waste as little of water as possible and this is one such technology which i believe uh, helps in reducing the amount of wastage in water and not only that the the best thing about this i'll just finish in a couple of minutes the best thing about this technology is that it's now up to you to kind of wind it the the it is it, it's just like a how a motor a motor uh, you get you make a more and more powerful motor by increasing the number of windings of copper windings so similar exactly similar as you increase or tune the number of windings of the CNT thread, you can change the performance and make it more and more robust system. For example, if we most of our experiments are done with eight centimeter uh, length of each winding, that means the, the, the diameter of the chakra is about eight centimeters. But then as you increase the number of windings, you go from 20 to almost 26, which is constitutes a total length of the CNT thread as 208 centimeters. You can treat up to 4000 ppm uh, uh, level of TDS. And this is uh, the maximum that you would probably encounter in, in Indian groundwater conditions. So what we are trying to get at is we are not trying to uh, address this uh, humongous problem uh, of uh, taking uh, seawater and making it portable, but rather uh, trying to address a more uh, bottom-up approach, uh, trying to adopt a more, more, more bottom-up approach and trying to take in groundwater and uh, 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 kind of looking into the possibility of whether groundwater can be uh, purified or desalinated in the comfort of your home 
and uh, in, within as less cost as possible, as less time uh, uh, resources resource if we taking into account all the resource consider uh, limitations that is uh, that would exist in a typical uh, rural scenario. And then within five minutes, we see that it's almost 90% of TDS can be removed. Even if the, the input water, water feedstock contains about 4000 ppm of uh, uh, total dissolved salts. So this is how the device looks like. We want to really start the field, uh, field trials and unfortunately that has not been possible um, uh, because of this um, uh, lockdown. But we, we hope to do that really soon by the, at least by within the next uh, month and a half or so. And uh, we want to really give a kind of uh, take it down to the society and i say uh, and like i said before it's targeted at the grassroots level not at a uh, kind of uh, um, the the scale at which ro plants exist but rather give it to india indian households and ask them to use it and 5 minutes is all it takes 5 minutes and the battery is all it takes so with that i like to thank uh, especially win foundation and iit bombay heritage foundation these they have been the key drivers and uh, key enablers of whatever has happened in this field from our lab and uh, also thank uh, the students, uh, uh, the wonderful set of students that I have. Uh, that uh, thank you and uh, sorry if I've exceeded my time limit. Thank you, Professor Subramanyam for sharing the details of your innovative project with us. Now we move on to startup session. The next presentation is by Professor Prabhu Rajagopalan from IIT Madras, founder and innovator of Alkin Robotics. Last year, this startup has won the top award in National Bioentrepreneurship Competition under Water and Sanitation category, sponsored by Win Foundation. We welcome Professor Prabhu Rajagopalan to give his presentation. Over to you, Professor Prabhu Rajagopalan. Please uh, give me just a, just a minute. I'm just bringing my presentation up online. Yeah, please. Professor Prabhu, you need to uh, switch on your video. Are you all able to see my screen now? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon to all of you and uh, thanks indeed uh, Mr. Paresh Vora and uh, all the team at Win Foundation for giving us this platform to speak about our work on uh, robotic interventions for septic tank and sewer lines. And uh, also thank you to Win Foundation for support to our project uh, over the last year and more um, in taking this work to the field. 
so this will be the outline of the presentation i'll start off with the problem then uh, describe what we are doing and various aspects of our work and then uh, I, i'll come to some uh, conclusions in terms of uh, my own work that backs this project so um, all of us are familiar with this uh, uh, very grim scenario where um, today india has about 60% of sewer lines uh, in the sense that 60% of job geographical distribution the actual number is unclear because the data is from uh, 2011 census but we believe it's approximately 50 50% 50%, 50% of the country runs on sewer lines with some septic tank treatment plants and 50% of the country runs on septic tanks which are more in the uh, rural and uh, urban as you say rural urban areas and uh, uh, the problem with septic tanks is that they tend to they need to be cleaned every few years at least every uh, by law by at least every 4 years but practically speaking people only clean every 6 years or 7 years whenever there are issues then people uh, tend to uh, uh, do this cleaning the law very uh, expressly prohibits human beings from entering septic tanks uh, whereas the law is a little bit uh, more um, flexible in terms of sewer lines because in the sewer lines they say if uh, the manhole is such that human beings cannot enter sorry uh, mechanized solutions are not possible then uh, human intervention can be permitted with some uh, uh, conditions but in septic tanks actually it is completely illegal to send people in but um, unfortunately what happens is uh, there is actually no solution currently for um, this type of scenario and therefore people do go in uh, we have interacted with these Uh, safai karmacharis and each of their stories is heartbreaking actually and uh, as i often say to some of my students and also generally that we are a country who is a space and nuclear and it superpower we are able to send probes to mars and moon we are able to have nuclear weapons and so on but it is very strange that we still do not have technologies for very practical problems like this so this comes to what mr vora was saying earlier that you know it is not as if the market is not there or the necessity is not there but what what is perhaps lacking is uh, you know the uh, the effort the research effort to take these solutions to the field it is not a trivial effort to uh, make products viable for these conditions so i'll come to that in a little bit of time in terms of the engineering this is these are uh, very very tough practical problems because you are dealing with uh, fluids that are not easy to uh, work in you are dealing with conditions that are not uniform uh, the septic tanks actually are not standardized in the country um, you can have septic tanks varying in different cities and our country is vast you have you have with, within this country you have places where it snows during winters to places where there is no winter at all so the practical conditions are varied and we need to have solutions that can address these kinds of conditions so our plan is summarized on this slide uh, is that we want to develop solutions addressing both these areas in terms of septic tanks as well as sewer lines but in our mind we think of uh, three types of interventions the first task is the homogenization of contents in these uh, uh, in these tanks Uh, and even in sewer lines you can have tank like segments where there are accumulations of um, contents in fact some other companies that are in the field today are doing exactly that they have homogenization solutions for these tank like segments so the first step is in the homogenization of these contents so you may say uh, uh, what is the challenge here the challenge is that uh, the contents of septic tanks and those segments of sewer lines can coagulate over a period of time and what you end up with are uh, uh, contents which which resemble something like uh, large blocks of uh, solids which are suspended in a colloidal fluid that's the kind of content and typically the tanks are uh, almost 30 to 40% of the tank will be this type of uh, material and uh, this is where actually the human operator is required currently because 
there are uh, pumps that can suck contents out of these tanks, but these uh, pumps cannot suck out if the contents are semi-solid in this manner. So we are uh, our first solution, which we call HomoSEP, is a robot that is geared towards uh, homogenizing these contents. In fact, in this uh, uh, seminar, as a participant, we have one of our, uh, I mean, the student leader who uh, who led this project, Divanshu Kumar. So uh, if there is opportunity later, he can join in in the discussion as well. Then um, the other aspect is once the homogenization is done, what do we do? We have uh, the common problems encountered are things like tree root penetration inside uh, um, inside uh, uh, septic tanks and sewer lines and so on. So we need to cut down those tree roots and so on. We need to have local repair. That's the kind of intervention. And finally, the third step is to suck out the contents and dispose. So that is a challenge in its own. I'll, uh, perhaps it is a, a much more longer term of a challenge because disposal of these contents is in itself a major problem uh, that needs to be tackled. So currently, within the what I'm going to talk about is the step one and step two, and where we are and what kind of progress have we made. So uh, we are working on a robotic solution for uh, uh, inspection and declogging in sewer pipes. And our uniqueness here is in trying to address solutions for small diameter sewer pipes. So as you know, that sewer lines are a serious network of pipes. Closer to the source, those are much smaller in diameter. But as you go farther and farther away, maybe towards the uh, treatment plant, then you have diameters increasing. Eventually, you will have op almost like um, semi, they are almost like uh, tunnels actually. They, which, those are the kinds of sewers you see in uh, movies and so on. And those are typically in older, larger cities like Mumbai. There is that big sewer network. So uh, there is a series of pipes and uh, typically the problem arises closer to the source. Closer, the source can be a home, it can be a set of homes, it can be an office, it can be an office block and so on. So closer to the home is where the problem is. And we are trying to develop a solution addressing this particular problem. So if I have time, I will also show a video of our recent work in this direction. Then uh, the uh, other thing that we are trying to do in parallel is also to try and develop a solution called HomoSEP, as I said, for homogenizing contents in the septic tanks. So this is the uh, uh, Sipoy robot that uh, our, our group developed uh, for the intervention task. And uh, this product was developed and demonstrated within laboratory conditions. And it is the first bio-inspired robot. So you can see that the uh, motion, locomotion of this robot inside the tank is through flapping fin-like mechanism. Uh, we have now uh, further improvised on this, on this uh, uh, design. And we now have a new propulsion that consists of uh, uh, the uh, of an imitation of something like a flagellum in, uh, on a bacteria. So because the contents of the septic tank are highly viscous, so we, we need to have more advanced solution than just a flapping. That was what we had originally. So we will have a hybrid propulsion that consists of flapping as well as um, like a flagellum in bacteria. Uh, what I'm going to focus a little bit more in this presentation and what Win Foundation has supported us is in taking this particular solution shown on this slide to the field. This is our HomoSEP robot. On the left, you see the whole robot uh, um, and it's different con different uh, uh, components. So you have one uh, component on the left, which is a detachable part, which consists of three fin three uh, blades that are retractable, like as like in an umbrella. And uh, this comp this part can be affixed to a fixed portion, something that is more that has a tripod stand kind of uh, uh, design. And this, this is what will go on top of the tank. And then once with the blade, we have the blade retracted. It can be sent inside the tank and then it will open up inside the tank. And then you will have homogen homogenization happening. So we have a control system that is external. That uh, so, so this is all as per design so that we don't have any sparking inside the tank as such. So on the right, you have uh, a photograph of an example mock-up tank that we have in our lab. And here in this particular case uh, was a particular type of uh, mock-up 
a septic tank fluid uh, which was based on grease more recently we have I, i'll speak to more recent speak about more recent developments in the coming slides so so far um, uh, we have studied further on the septic tank sludge because the grease based solution uh, is uh, imitates the behavior of sludge in some ways but it doesn't uh, imitate the hardening behavior of the sludge over a period of time so we have done further studies on these sludges and um, we have also tried to study the profile of the blade that is most suited for working in these type of sludges so we have performed simulations and so on and uh, through these simulations what you now see is an altered design of the blade profile what we call a dual fill design and uh, we believe it is this kind of design that is more ideal for practical homogenization and we are also working on <coughs> a mechanisms by which we can deploy something like this on a mini truck so that this can be uh, mobile it can reach small alleyways it can reach backyards of homes in rural settings and so on so um, i will if as i said i will play a video on the uh, sewer line side of things and uh, the pandemic has affected our plans mainly in terms of the fabrication but also more importantly uh, something i would like to highlight and bring up is that the septic tanks and sewer lines have been shown to have high concentrations of the corona virus and uh, the government has come up with certain uh, plans to mitigate these in fact the standard operating procedure now says that before cleaning certain additives are, are to be added to the septic tank or sewer line although sorry to report that in practice these uh, guidelines are hard to come by as such so uh, we are very grateful to win foundation um, for supporting one of the first research backed problems um, in this domain and uh, i am emphasizing that because a lot of engineering and practical research is needed before we take out a solution to the field and a, a large number of trials are required before we roll this products out and in this process i envisage that the support of uh, organizations such as startups is also crucial so just a brief background for on, on my own work um, my work is both academic as well as um, um, very collaborative and international and in our lab we take very strong pride in translational research so we have developed various products over the years um, addressing strategic industrial as well as social sectors uh, and we have received a wide range of recognitions for this type of work and in particular uh, as mr vora said in his introduction we've been um, very active in the sphere of uh, startups so so far i have participated in three startups planes solinas and zaima just as we speak last year last week or earlier this week planes was awarded the national startup award under the uh, ndt 4.0 uh, industry 4.0 category and on the on the slide here you see pictures of a uh, planes robot deployed during a tragedy in meghalaya late last year when miners were trapped in rat hole uh, tunnels so uh, solinas here is the company that is involved in the sewer line side of things and alkim uh, is a team that we have been developing to for the septic tank side of work Uh, as ms shanti said alkim won the uh, national bio entrepreneurship award uh, again late last year but uh, our plans of rolling out a startup in this domain are also uh, affected because of the pandemic and we are struggling in terms of raising new funds and so on so the current thinking is to synchronize uh, operations between solinas which is already doing work in the sewer line space uh, with the work by the team uh, of alkimi so that's the current development as such so thank you and as we uh, if there is a when the discussion is going on i'll also try and show a video on work done in the sewer space thank you ma'am you are mute Thank you, Professor Prabhura Jagopalan. The next presentation is by Mr. Kumar Kadika, one of the founders of Austin Technology. Green Foundation is supporting this startup for its product market validation through our community partner, Mahila Housing Seva Trust. 
We welcome Mr. Kumar Kalika to give his presentation. Over to you, Mr. Kumar Kalika. Yes. So I'll just take a second in showing this video from just late last week, and you can see this okay. is a work done by our our startup partner Solinas in uh, the robot called SIRS, which we are developing for inspection of sewer lines. And uh, you know this, this is actually a, a live video taken from a sewer in a uh, in a block apartment block or actually an industrial block close to Chennai. And uh, that's the kind of view that uh, we de de see. And this is the uh, view of tree root penetration, which is a common problem both in sewer line as well as in septic tanks. Yeah, I stop at that point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Prabhu. Over to you, Kalika. Yeah, is it uh, like my presentation is uh, visible now? Huh? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the like uh, Foundation for providing us this platform. So I just start now. Like uh, I am from I am Kalika from Austin Technology, and we are an industrial design firm based out of Jaipur, and uh, so. We, yeah, we come out with a problem like uh, which are being faced by like uh, the the young gens and the old people as well. And uh, when we try to like uh, uh, reach out to these people, and uh, we found out like uh, people with uh, different medical conditions are there, which are, we are facing. Uh, the, you are facing the common problem or the basic problem of using a toilet, uh, and and they face this problem a lot more. Especially when they uh, go for uh, commute out and in the public spaces, they don't have enough accessible toilets in the uh, public domain. And uh, so we thought of de developing a solution uh, which could address the problem of all these people, like especially the people with diverse medical conditions. As you can say that uh, a people uh, who is an old age and one who is an younger with an amputee who is in wheelchair, so something has to be developed for people with uh, different varieties of medical conditions. So we come up with solution uh, which could be adjusted as per the people's uh, medical conditions and, and give them a convenient sitting positions especially. So and which can also be fitted to the existing solutions or existing uh, toilets uh, which is installed within their homes or maybe in the public spaces. So which will uh, like uh, give us more uh, convenience to the government as well as the people to accommodate these kind of solutions at their to solve for the solving the problem. So the major advantage of this uh, solution is that so it could be fitted to the existing toilets as well as the uh, adjustable uh, seating positions like the adjustable seating height. So here you can see in the second slide that the seating positions could be adjusted uh, as per the convenience of the person who is using it. So let's say, for example, like a, a, in a uh, in common like a public uh, school, if something is installed like this, so there could be a possibility that the teacher uh, could be a, a person who will be using it, or maybe a student. So for both of the people, person like the, the convenience sitting position will be different. So, so but we can't install multiple uh, solutions for them. But if we have something like that, which could be adjusted as per their needs, so definitely this will help them too. Uh, give them a better uh, convenient uh, experience. So this is what we have. And uh, we have also developed like two variants of this, like one is the motorized one and other is the uh, uh, other is the me mechanical um, version. And whereas the motorized version will help the people like especially the arthritis people, which may need uh, people uh, 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 some other people uh, to assist them in uh, while standing or uh, like from the sitting positions. So that mechanism help uh, like uh, act as a lifting mechanism. Uh, like uh, if you sit here sitting on the toilet seat and uh, then you can use the buttons to lift up the uh, seat, uh, seat uh, the commode, seating cupboard. And after that, after a certain height, it will be convenient for a user to stand from there. So that is the that will be the advantage of for the uh, motorized version. So 
of it was a, a, like a pleasure for us and uh, that win uh, uh, foundation has given us the platform for the trials and we feel that this uh, field trial is actually a product transformation stage and where the uh, we will be able have we will have deep understanding of the problem and uh, we can have deep study of the demographic uh, social uh, cultural and economic factor about the end user and definitely it will help us to refine the product to bring the uh, change in the consumer behavior because for these kind of problems uh, or maybe the consumer changing the consumer behavior is the most important thing which is uh, which took around a very long time for the government also to bring the change and maybe we if we could do something like uh, we have to design certain solutions that will help us to bring that change and currently we are uh, doing this uh, trial at three different locations and uh, i will ask like if any so if anybody in the like uh, in the who is attending this lecture like uh, webinar if anyone want to experience that you try to use that it will be very helpful for us to get the feedback or the response from that to improvise the solution and uh, yeah i will ask like people like uh, we have to uh, connect together to build a better future and uh, as a like uh, as in and we are taking a step towards improving the life of 65 lakhs of uh, divyangjans and 14 crore arthritis patient so if any uh, questions are uh, there thank you mr kumar kalika Next presentation is by Dr. Rajul Patkar, founder and innovator of Proximal Solutions. In foundation, he is also supporting this startup for its product market validation through our committee partner, Arid Communities and Technology. We welcome Dr. Rajul to give her pre presentation. Over to you, Rajul. Yeah, thank you, Shanti, and thank you, Parish, uh, Parish sir, and uh, Jadeja sir for giving us the opportunity to do our field trials. at uh, ag foundation in gujarat uh, so my am i is my screen visible yes is my yes. screen visible yeah yes yes okay. sir okay you can probably put it in slide show mode yeah so so i did my masters and phd from iit bombay and then i'm a founder of a startup where uh, our vision is to bring cost effective technologies for agriculture and when we talk about ag agriculture primarily these are the two sc scenarios which comes to our mind one is a technology driven agriculture countries like india uh, israel usa netherlands and uh, they are like uh, doing controlled agriculture they are doing precision agriculture uh, but whereas when we think about india there are many organizations like act foundations like when working for the uh, community where uh, they are trying to help farmers so that they also now our indian agriculture which was mostly using very traditional form of farming can also now uh, adopt technology slowly because the mindset of the farmers the whole thing has is really difficult so that this kind of foundations and the organizations and the startups and the researchers have to work together so that the technology can be uh, uh can be transformed to the farmers so if you see about in agriculture apart from other problems the water consumption is 70% of the water, uh, agriculture is using ground water and because of that depleting ground waters are depleting and other thing is that the efficiency of uh, uh, water use in agriculture is also very low and it is not because there are not technologies which do not exist they are the technologies which are there from years and years but in india these technologies are not adopted the reasons are simple first thing they are very expensive and all this uh, farmers uh, needs hand holding a kind of a service support and that's why this technologies are not suitable uh, considering all our uh, farmers and agriculture background and that's where the soil sense uh, actually uh, started and what as a soil sense we want to do is we want to build this gap this technology gap we want to build innovate customize the solutions so that this uh, technology gap gap in the agriculture can be uh, reduced 
So as a soil sense, uh, what happens to the farmer? Uh, one, com one company cannot come up with one particular product and ask the second company to come up with a different and then ask farmers to uh, use different technologies. But what a farmer needs is a complete solution. Now, whether uh, uh, whether soil sense is providing or whether ABC company is providing, they need a complete solution. So we call our soil sense platform as a 3A platform. We say acquire the data. So what is required for precision agriculture for reducing the uh, consumption of water kind of a sensor based irrigation. So irrigate only when you uh, when the I mean crop needs that water. So you need to acquire the farm specific data. So you need to have affordable technologies to acquire that data. Then this data has to be analyzed using AI ML or um, algorithms and then the farmers has to be given a small uh, notifications that OK, you need to irrigate. You don't have to irrigate. You have to put the fertilizer. You have to put the pesticide. This is what the farmer wants to know. Farmer doesn't need to know about what is there as as a technological solution. Right. And so for that reason to capture the farm specific data, we have and uh, that too to uh, reduce the consumption of water or improve the water use efficiency in the agriculture. What we realize that soil moisture sensor is the most important thing. Now what happens is when you do a Google for soil moisture sensor, you see a sensor from 200 rupees to 30,000 rupees, but you need to have a reliable product which is reliable cost effective so that and it can uh, be uh, calibrated based on our Indian conditions. So that's the reason we first built a soil moisture sensor. Once we built a soil moisture sensor, which is uh, very, very, I mean, uh, which can be compared to the sensors available in the market and at, at, at different, I mean, they are very, uh, these sensors are reliable uh, and at the same time, the lower cost. Now, with the sensors, what do you do? The next step was to integrate these sensors in a platform, an IoT platform, where the data can be captured from the field and it can actually, data can be pushed to the cloud. You run the analysis on the cloud and then actually send a SMS or a notification to the farmer. So this kind of soil sense station, we have, apart from the soil moisture sensor, we say the farmers just not only about the irrigation, but he also needs more value. So we actually included multiple sensors in this system and every uh, all this data is actually pushed to the cloud and analysis is done. Now, uh, apart from that, uh, what you know in India, 80% of the farmers are marginal farmers. Now, if I build a, a solution which is only uh, focused for horticulture farmers or an expensive solution, then actually this bottom of the pyramid are this uh, marginal and small farmers will never see the use of technology. And that's the reason we came up with this portable moisture meter, which can be shared among marginal farmers. It is doing the similar. Uh, it is cost effective. It is lower cost than the soil sense station. Uh, let me tell you that all our solutions are very, very cost effective and we are just one fourth or one fifth of the cost of this commercially available systems. Now with this soil moisture meter, the farmers can share this system uh, and uh, their data. Now with the soil moisture meter, how this date uh, this is used is uh, you have a sensor and you have a small portable. This is the first version of the product. This is going to really get changed and this is the product we are actually supplied to Act Foundation for the field trials. Now there is a mobile app associated with this product. So what happens is that now let's say there is a farm manager or there is a one one person uh, who is uh, let's say who uh, who is working with farmers or let's say there are hundreds of farmers and one farm manager he can actually add that multiple farmers their field locations their crops and all that information plus he can actually hand over this portable moisture meter to him and he it is very simple to use he can actually get uh, do, does the field profiling of his moisture it is it can be stored and the history can be maintained so it, it this data can also be used for further analysis and all this data is stored and and all this data is also available on the cloud apart from that we realized that the weather stations are also required and that's why we also built a affordable weather station plus as you can see that we have a cloud platform and anal analytics platform where we give a weather fo uh, forecast for the next seven days plus we have a sensor data we can do analysis even the farm manager we have the option of setting up the threshold value for the soil moisture uh, for depending on the availability of water. It is uh, some it is better to maintain the soil moisture at field capacity, but it is possible that when the water is less, you can actually have the water between uh, wilting point and the field, capa uh, field capacity. So those thresholds can be set. 
so the our solution is very simple like for example now i don't know because of the covid we could not actually go and install the system uh, in gujarat so what we say is that we uh, did a video call we actually sent videos so it is very simple to work so the you you select the product what is required for you let's say portable rs oil sensation we send the data uh, we send the product you install it and then it, uh, you once you switch it on it's on and running the data starts coming so we have done pilots and we have done this in various different crops like this is a banana crop where we are monitoring temperature and we are advising based on that um similarly we have worked with many researchers also this is in one of the research research uh, farms in uh, for citrus where we could show by using sensor based irrigation you can uh, reduce the consumption of water and increase the uh, yield and quality similarly we did it in the this system can be used in greenhouses or in the open farms uh, 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 research labs uh, wherever so in one of this bell pepper in a poly house again we showed the improvement in the quality in a potato in an open farm again water saving and improvement in quality so this system can be used across various crops various soils at different different geographies again this is one more in green gram where we showed the improvement in yield and reduction in water also as i told you to add more value to the farmer the major problem apart from this irrigation the the crop loss due to disease and pest is again a major problem for the farmer 15 to 40% of the crop is lost due to pest so it is possible and most of the solutions which are available are mostly identify identifying let's say once the disease has occurred then it can identify okay this so and so but here with this what we are planning to do is since we are collecting all this data it is possible to predict because there are these models available it is possible possible to predict whether this particular disease is going to occur and then accordingly the farmer can be given advisory and he can actually put pesticide well in advance um so that he doesn't have to put uh, 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 the quantity of the pesticide can be reduced because you are actually identifying it and you are trying to kill the problem when it is in a very initial stage uh similarly we have tried to predict diseases in various crops like in uh, in grapes we tried uh so you can see that when we thought that there is a possibility of powdery mildew we could actually cross check with the in the actual farm so the overall we have worked in various crops and soils and uh, generally shown this reduction in water and improvement in yield and this is our core team um and now i think i am in if there is any question they can write to me and they can connect with me uh, so this is about uh, our product and uh, our thing these are various pilots and pictures so thank you so much thank you dr raju next we welcome mr kirat kirani program management specialist from mahila housing seva trust to give his brief presentation and also to share some of community users voice with us over to you mr kirat Thank you, Santhi ji, and uh, thank you, Win Foundation, for giving me this opportunity to share our learnings and findings from uh, the field trials that we have carried out for various technology. Before before I talk about my findings, I will just like to take uh, 30 seconds to talk about my organization. Uh, we are a 25 year or organization having presence in seven states in India and almost uh, 30 plus uh, cities. we are a grassroots level organization particularly working with uh, urban poor and focusing on women so our approach is women empowerment and through this empowerment how you can improve the quality of life by improving that their habitat so we focus on water and sanitation we focus on sustainable energy affordable housing livelihood and skill development and definitely the most important thing is how you can strengthen the governance part where urban poor have their voice with the city government and the private sectors now when we talk about uh, piloting the technology at the field level what is the what is the uh, intention or the objective of uh, the organization like maila housing seva trusts so we are very clear that when we are piloting a technology basically it's related to improving the quality of life of urban poor particularly the slum dwellers so how we can uh, improve their habitat their housing and the essential services related to the housing and when we are trying out the technology we are we are working on both the parts so definitely digital technology and the non digital technologies how we particularly pilot this technology uh, in the field so there are there are two uh, it's it's piloted at a two different level 
So when we talk about piloting a technology starts with an identifying a problem. So generally these problems are identified by our field worker who are day in day out touch with the urban poor community in the slums. So once a uh, problem is identified, let, let's say the problem can be related to the quality of the water that they are uh, supplied by the government or it can be related to anything like heat stress because of changing climate. So when problem is identified by a field worker through our community leaders, we try to look for a solution which is available in a market. So we as a non-profit organization are not into the development of the solution. So we do our market research for the various solutions which are available in the market. Once we have identified the solutions, we start our conversation with the uh, social enterprise or the technologist who is supplying this solution in the market to understand uh, that uh, how how they uh, what is the price level that they will be able to supply this solution to the urban poor community. What are the kind of the services that they are providing? What are the warranties and the guarantees that will be provided by the uh, business person uh, who is supplying this solution? The second step is once we shortlisted this uh, solution based on the various parameter. We do a demonstration of the solution with the poor urban uh, uh, households. So actually these technologies are installed at a household level for a certain duration of time depending on the technology. So let's say if technology requires a testing period of three months, we, we with the help of the community leaders will be monitoring the impact of using this technology on the quality of the life of the people. And these feedbacks are generally collected by the community leaders who are using this technology. And once we find that no, this technology is really giving a result, we then uh, scale up this technology for the larger population. But many times it happens that it's not only about saying that technology is good or bad, but it's also identifying which are the aspects of the technology which needs to be improved to make it more appropriate for the urban poor. So generally when we see that technologies are designed in a laboratory, they try to do the research basically from the field and design a technology. But when you install a technology on a ground, there are real feedback which comes from a people who are using a technology. And it is important that these feedbacks are then incorporated into this uh, product. So it's more appropriate for the target audience. So we, we make sure that this feedback loop from a community to the uh, manufacturer who is producing this technology is given in a right way and then the technologies when they incorporate this feedback and redesign their technology they are again uh, tested in the field to make sure that they are delivering a right impact. So just to give you an example a uh, few years back we work with a uh, uh, social entrepreneur who was into this providing the roofing solution. So this company is called Mode Roof. Uh, it's now very well known in Ahmedabad. And when a few years back when they started uh, producing this uh, cool roof, this roof, uh, the one that you can see on the left, left side picture, the blue roof, they started producing this roof from the plant fiber. And the claim that the company was making was that when you are substituting this mode roof or when you're substituting the tin seat with the mode roof, it reduces the inside temperature by four to five degrees Celsius. And this was extremely important product for us because when we are working with the slums and particularly in cities like Ahmedabad, the summers are really harsh and the temperature goes above 45 degrees Celsius. And it's mostly unbearable for the poor people to stay inside their house. And we all might have noticed that when you go to a slum area, the houses are not only for, uh, uh, they are used uh, for a dual purpose. You will see small business running out of these houses. And when these uh, houses in summer, it's not possible for them to stay inside. It has a direct impact on their productivity and it turns into the decrease in their monthly income. So we found this product very appropriate. We had an earlier conversation with this technologies and he agreed to install this product in four to five slums in Ahmedabad. So these uh, products were installed and then we, uh, we actually did a pilot testing where uh, thermometers were installed into the houses to make sure that readings are taken four to five times in a day by the women you in, know, in house, uh, houses in which this uh, uh, mode roof is installed. So this experiment was carried out for almost 12 months to ensure how, how this mode roof is functioning in summer, rainy season and in winter. And based on the feedback, this uh, mode roof was then designed. So the preliminary feedback that we gave it to the technologies, the feedback that came from uh, uh, the urban poor community was that definitely is effective. So it's reducing the temperature by let's say two to three degrees Celsius. It's not always four to five degrees Celsius, but definitely it makes impacts when you are substituting the tin roof with this mode roof technology. 
the second feedback that we received from uh, uh, this women was rega regarding the aesthetic of this mode roof so the first prototype that came into the field was definitely blue in color and as you can see in the picture the installation was in the form of a slope roof so there were two feed feedback one was regarding the color so product was good but women feel that when it is a blue, blue color from inside it creates lot of darkness and people generally don't prefer to install it because it's a dark color second uh, feedback was that if we can co convert this mode roof which is installed in a slope into a flat roof then poor people can actually use their roof for a different purpose so in gujarat uh, uh, generally the roofs are used for various purpose include including the livelihood and also there is a festival which is called uh, which is very famous it's a kite flying festival where people want to use their roof for enjoying that festival so if you are using a slope roof you can't actually uh, use that roof for any other purpose so that was the feedback given to the uh, to the manufacturer and manufacturer was very open to the feedback and the picture that you can see on the right side he he changed the color of the roof which was converted from blue to the white he designed the roof in a way that you can actually install the flat roof so it gives a feeling like it's an rcc roof so another aspect is like when when you design a product which is more aspirational so it, though it's not an rcc roof when it is installed it gives a feeling that it is an rcc roof so that's very aspirational for the poor people because they want they converted their tin roof into an rcc roof so you can see that because of the feedback the product has changed drastically and it was highly acceptable by the poor community now one thing that i will like to highlight it uh, is like cost of this uh, product so on an average this uh, uh, roof was costing 70000 for a family so everything was really good but the cost was the big issue and we felt that poor people are not going to invest such a big amount for replacing the tin roof with this cool roof technology but after the demonstration there was a significant increase in the demand and within the 2 to 3 years period we have seen we have installed almost like uh, 300 mod roofs just in slums of ahmedabad and now these mod roofs are even being installed in delhi and city of rachi so how how we make so definitely the product was very costly 70000 but that's that's where we bring in the financial institution so mahila housing seva trust has a cooperative society so we made sure that a financial product is designed to buy this uh, uh, mod roof so loan product was designed where the 70000 can be paid in 18 to 24 installment and that's why the product was costly but because of the financial product or the loan that was designed by the financial institute it was made affordable for the end user so the feedback that we we receive from here is that it's not always that when you design a product for your poor people it has to be cheap it's more important that how you can make that product affordable through the financial uh, product also in terms of the loans or any other financial support another another technology we tried out was solar reflective paint this was also exactly the uh, exactly addressing the same problem so it was reducing the inside temperature by 2 to 3 degree celsius the only problem uh, so we installed we piloted this technology and it was very effective it was costing around 5 to 7000 uh, for a for a household to paint their roof and this will last around like uh, 3 to 4 years so every 3 to 4 years they have to repaint their uh, roof to make sure that uh, it continues working whereas the mode roof was working for around 20 years so we have been using for 7 years and it's very durable and manufacturer is claiming that it will be uh, its life is around 20 years so both the products are addressing the same issues it are these are in the different price range the solar reflective paint is available at 5 to 7000 the mode roof is available at like 60 to 70000 so the role that we see as a non profit organization is that we identify a problem we find out a multiple solutions from the market in a different pri price range we provide that options to the community and then let community decide how much they want to invest for a particular problem and there are there are people who are investing in the solar reflective paints and there are people who are investing in the mode roof which are in a different price range now if i have to summarize my learnings from the pilots that we have done so this is not only about the mode roof but we have carried out almost, almost like 20 plus, plus pilots i think the four important learning is that we, when we design a product for a urban poor we generally feel that uh, aesthetics are not important and repeatedly we have been given feedback why urban poor that all the products has to be aspirational so even poor people are as much conscious about uh, any middle class or higher middle class regarding the selection of the product so they will like the product to look beautiful they will like the product to make sure that that adds to the social status uh, in their society 
second is about it's not necessary that product has to be cheap i think it's more important that we have to make it affordable so when we saw that people 300 plus families have invested 70000 rupees in mod roof definitely it's not cheap the average monthly income of a family in amdavad in slum area is 15000 to 20000 rupees and family is ready to invest like 5000 rupees a month as an installment to install this uh, product so affordability is more important third when it comes about product is access so how easily these products are accessible in the market sometime products are excellent one those are not readily available in the market and if they are readily available in the market the service post installations are really not good so whenever a manufacturer or social enterprise is coming up with a product i think access is very important how you ensure that these products are accessible not only till installation but if a product requires a service then those services are accessible to the poor community then only that product can be scaled up or adapted at a large scale definitely fourth which is very important is user friendliness that how how uh, user friendly is the product for whom you have designed so these are the basic learnings that we have from the various pilot and uh, as i know that there are many social enterprises who are who are on this webinar so uh, any product that you will like to field test it we will be happy if it is relevant to our mandate and you if you are open to incorporate the feedback that is given by a community to redesign the product to make it more appropriate to the target audience i will conclude my presentation here over back to you santhi ji thank you siraj bhai for sharing some of community feedback with us next we welcome dr yogesh jadeja director of arik communities and technology to share some of community users who are with us over to you yogesh bhai uh thank you shanti thank you parish bhai and win foundation for uh, giving the uh, opportunity to explain express our uh, experiences in the by using this startup uh i will straight away go to the uh, startup experiences uh, without wasting any time uh, we have uh, experience of three type of the startup one is that water water quality testing kit that is prepared by spf uh, uh, bangalore second we are uh, trying to install this automatic weather station and using uh, soil moisture meter is explained by dr rajul so uh, first first one that is a uh, uh, that is more concern about the soil and water quality part and farmers are normally utilizing whatever the fertilizer and water irrigation etc by without considering their soil quality and water quality so we have introduced this uh, water testing it's a very uh, handy kit and introduced to the our bujal jankar and bujal jankar i will uh, explain in two sentence that bujal jankar are a person from the community is a knowledgeable person for geohydrological science and now we are introducing him with the various kind of technology so that he can by using this kind of the handy techniques and he can uh, facilitate the farmers or any ground water users to utilize the uh, water as well as the soil and land like uh, land kind of the water uh, natural resources uh, that is one thing and second thing that we are trying to uh, introduce this uh, all agro agro meteorological advisory system to the farmer by uh, using this automatic weather station and moisture uh, moisture meter so that he so that farmer comes to know about the weather conditions and uh, moisture conditions of the of his own soil and land so that he can design his irrigation irrigation thing irrigation schedules uh, by using this technology by using this application we want to address the ground water management issue at the demand side uh, by at, by at a, at a scale so this uh, these two initiatives we are introducing uh, with the uh, with the startup along with this we are also trying to introduce our bujal jankas knowledge system because without uh, any uh, community person any any community representative without uh, uh, information and knowledge of this kind of the technology and the science we cannot uh, success with at a scale so uh, we are introducing this technologies with the bujal jankas and bujal jankar are main carriers who brings this technology to the communities and as parish bhai has rightly pointed out that we need to bring the community uh, we need to empower the community for the use, utilizing this science and technologies and simultaneously we want to sensitize the scientists and technologies so that they they uh, they bring this uh, they evolve this kind of techniques so that the community can afford and community can utilize in easy manners 
so this is our experience and we are we are going to introduce uh, with this communities and uh, and also uh, by using this uh, technology we are trying to develop a uh, mobile applications i will end up end here and uh, thanks again thank you very much yeah thank you yogesh bhai now we request professor subramanian to take up the questions from audience posted under qa box and moderate the session over to you professor subramanian yeah thank you thank you ma'am uh, it has been a slightly longer session than planned but uh, we still would uh, like to uh, go through the questions and un answer to them to the best possible capacity uh, so i'll uh, so i'll uh, go uh, sequentially um, so the question from aishani goswami uh, uh, she is asked about uh, the chakra prototype is there a need to replace the cdi wire or thread after certain usage in response to that yes we do find that the cdi threads uh, start uh, uh, mechanically degrading after about 200 cycles so that means uh, for every 1000 liters of water that we uh, desalinate uh, we will have to replace them but the the cost of the threads works out to be about uh, 150 rupees uh, uh, for the entire unit so that means uh, we still can uh, it it, it uh, we are still trying to get it into the point of uh, complete affordability vis-a-vis -vis the uh, reverse osmosis uh, technology uh, cost. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Um, so uh, the next question is from uh, Professor Anushri Malik from IIT Delhi. So is it? Uh, it's about uh, whether the the technology, the desalination uh, uh, chakra uh, chakra device can be used for industrial purposes. Um, this. Um, uh, yeah, in principle, yes, it might, it might should be possible to use it for industrial purposes. Uh, but the problem with uh, most of the industrial wastewater is that it, besides salts, it contains a variety of different other contaminants, and so we don't really know whether uh, we can actually use it. So, for example, organic contaminants, uh, dyes, these constitute a major part of the desalination, uh, uh, a major part of the contaminants from uh, industrial wastewater. So that's something which we have to work out. So right now I'm not in a position to give you a definitive answer, answer to that. Uh, the other question is uh, uh, from uh, Sunny Sazina Sazina. Uh, so uh, who asks uh, whether uh, we can guide us to resolve groundwater salinity issue at portable levels in coastal Kutch region. Uh, I'm all I have to say to you is uh, just wait for a couple of more months. Uh, we are uh, working uh, to kind of uh, bring the the chakra prototype onto your household. Uh, so once that is there, we should be able to see a solution emerge out of that. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Indrajit, uh, please forgive me for the title. I don't know, so I'm just looking at the usernames. Uh, so Dr. Indrajit from IIT Kharagpur. Uh, has a question for Professor Prabhu, uh, who say who, uh, the question is um, whether the sewage clear clearing uh, robot is powered using renewable technology, uh, renewable energy. So uh, I would request uh, Professor Prabhu to answer, uh, take this. Professor Prabhu, if you can please unmute yourself and uh, uh, so I uh, is it uh, the question is related to what kind of energy source the the uh, robot is uh, using. Yeah, so for now we are actually uh, trying to use battery power. So uh, and this battery could be either pre charged or on site. We also looking at powering using gen sets or even the engine of the vehicle itself. But in the future we are looking at because battery is part of our uh, uh, one of our sources that we are working on in the future this can easily made into a renewable kind of uh, uh, development um yes on the on the question of the robot um, uh, i also have a question for professor prabhu if i may uh, so um, like since uh, what you presented is really sounds really interesting and uh, relevant to indian scenario Thank so you, in that sir. context uh, uh, so most of the sewage is mainly made up of this organic uh, muck, organic matter. So uh, is there a possibility to use uh, instead of, uh, of course, you your device has a movable uh, rotor blades uh, to kind of uh, homogenize the entire thing. So is it, have you thought about uh, using ultrasonic uh, energy 
like uh, pulsed ultrasonic waves to kind of uh, decluster them or uh, kind of make them uh, more uh, liquefy them homogenize them so indeed we we are we have been looking at a range of techniques we are also looking at chemical homogenization actually okay. uh, but the challenge with specific challenge with ultrasound or any acoustic uh, uh, elastic wave method is that this is a highly viscous fluid and, uh -huh. and it's exotropic fluid so okay. sound propagation in this kind of fluid itself is not studied okay okay so, uh, it, it has its own challenges okay. so this mechanized solution is the simplest actually sure. yeah. okay yeah thank you thank you thank you for answering that and um, then uh, if i may just uh, proceed forward uh, sazina has another question for uh, austin technology um, can this smart uh, retrofit toilet advocate with government programs on swachh bharat abhiyan i see that you have already answered this question in the chat box but you might want to kind of elaborate it uh, in a in a short uh, in a few seconds time do i have austin technologies here you can please you may please unmute yourself and uh, try to answer this question whether this how how do you plan to take this and integrate it with uh, uh, existing government programs especially like swachh bharat abhiyan and things like that yeah uh, so actually uh, we are working with uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, like niti ayog and uh, like uh, once we complete this trial uh, definitely we will collaborate with like we already in the touch with the government then we can uh, come up with the plan like uh, which uh, just to see, is it audible Yes, yes, yes. So, you're right. Yeah. So, just we then we can come up with the like plans, like or maybe we have to go through the tenders or whatever, and then based on that, whatever comes through, we we will execute that. Yeah. And uh, a, a follow-up question on that is asked by uh, uh, Indrajit from IIT Kharagpur, uh, who is uh, inquires about the cost of the uh, the system, the the portable, the, the yes. user-friendly toilet system. Uh, yes. The so uh, for the our product right yes 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 the we have two variants the first one is the uh, like manual one so which will be costing to the cost, uh, customers uh, in the range of like 2500 and okay. uh, for the motorized version it will cost around 20000 okay to the end customers and this includes the installations cost as well Uh, yes, uh, like uh, we can have like we are just because um, since this is designed in order to like it could be installed very easily. Just uh, what uh, a normal uh, like uh, plumber or any anyone who can just fix it with four screws, it could be installed within that. Like since if we go with this model, like for the installation on, we have to build in entire infrastructure for that. So we are not sure for that. but this, yeah we are planning like we can have in some reasons we can do this but for the some other locations uh, we may go for like uh, in it like uh, we have, person has to install by himself okay so uh, other question is from uh, thank you for answering that the other, we do also have another question from uh, dr ranishri malik uh, from iit delhi uh, do you need approvals from ethic ethics committee i am not very sure about with which uh, uh, topic uh, she uh, uh, the, this question pertains to i am sure it's not related to the soil sense it could be either due uh, uh, address to mr uh, siraz or uh, uh, austin so i'm not sure which one so yeah maybe in our product uh, it's uh, like Until unless it is very much used in the uh, medicinal, like yeah. Uh, so I think uh, generally it may need yeah. Yeah, certain certifications. Mr. Siraz, I would believe the ethics committee because that's a there is a direct uh, human uh, participation that is involved in. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, the the roofing uh, thing. so no the nothing no permissions are required because uh, the product that we are procuring are already available in the market and what we are generally doing as a non profit organization is we are identifying the options which are an appropriate solution for the people that we are working with 
and they are selecting the solution and in installing at an individual level. This is not like anything promoting as an organization. We are just giving them an option. So as of today, we haven't faced any issue regarding any permissions from the government. In fact, the example that I give mode roof after the successful installation and ad adaptation by like uh, 50 families, the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, both the solar reflective paint and mode roof was promoted by Ahmedabad Municipal Corpor Corporation. And today it's a plan of uh, as a part of a plan of their Ahmedabad heat action plan. Hmm. But yeah, no permissions are required as of now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, so, uh, oh, for the roofing issue. Yeah. So the, I think that uh, um, the question from uh, Dr. Anushri Malik has been answered. Uh, so uh, coming back, uh, there are a couple of questions for uh, Dr. Rajul Patkar from uh, Soil Sense. Uh, so the one uh, question which I would like her to answer is uh, um, the second. Uh, what is the main advantage of measuring the soil moisture in agricultural fields? Uh, this is a very generic question, so I would request uh, Dr. Rajul to kind of um, uh, give a very short answer, brief, brief answer. Yeah. So I would here say that, of course, the moisture sensors are required to improve the water efficiency usage in agriculture. But the right person here would be Dr. Jadeja because he's the one who is the user and he he has a huge experience. So if it comes from his mouth, that will be better. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I yes, uh, Mr. J uh, Yogesh, yeah, can you can you uh, add on to the thing in a brief uh, manner? Yeah. See, plant requires moisture, not water. So, if the moisture content uh, if is known, uh, known with the farmer, he can schedule his irrigation, whether irrigation is given to the farm or not. So that's why this uh, moisture is required because if you if you saturate the farm with the water, plant cannot grow. So the moisture is the only content that plant is uh, taking from the soil uh, for its grown growth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yogesh. Uh, the other, uh, there is one more question from uh, Hiram, uh, who is a student at IIT Gandhinagar. Um, he's, uh, he has a lot of uh, thoughts uh, and inputs. He requires a lot of kind of input, some inputs on how do you basically go about uh, uh, do, uh, creating a startup? So where do you start, whether you start at the proof of concept level or the prototype level? Where is the funding going to come from and those kind of questions? So uh, Dr. Rajulia, please. Uh, uh, you are muted, so please uh, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, so I would say that I'll directly connect with him and uh, share my experience about yeah, whole sure. thing. That yeah, would be that better. Would be better. That would be better. So, yeah. uh, Hiram, uh, can you please uh, write to Dr. Uh, Rajul Patkar uh, directly? And uh, she, I'm sure she would be very helpful in this. Uh, Dr. Anushri Malik from IT Delhi, only salts are left out. Oh, okay, so rest removed by biological techniques. In that sense, yes, it's definitely possible. It look, it looks implementable. There are, there are certain challenges in scaling this up, but we are trying to work this out. Yeah, and. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hiram uh, has another question for me, uh, which is uh, related to the mechanism involved in powering the chakra cycles. So it's basically the mechanism of electric polarization. So you apply a potential the positive and a negative plate and uh, things are going to opposites are going to attract. So the negatives in the water, meaning the chloride sulfates and fluorides in the water are going to be attracted towards the positive electrode and uh, vice versa. And that's what I think uh, Paresh has to also try to answer that question. Uh, thanks, thanks Paresh. Uh, so uh, there is an anonymous question from <laughs> question from anonymous as well, which I'll take. Uh, using chakra device will only remove the dissolved salts from saline water, but still it would require a pre or post process to make it drinkable. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't require remove the the biological uh, matter uh, from uh, or biological impurities in water, uh, which uh, probably can be treated using a uh, ultraviolet uh, zapping. So uh, uh, UV light, which is what you would find in your uh, uh, commercial uh, aquaguard kind of uh, water filtration devices that you uses uh, uh, kind of UV uh, C light to kind of uh, 
deactivate the organic and the biological content yes but chakra is mainly did, uh, oriented towards removing the dissolved salts you are right in that yeah uh, if uh, that is uh, i think i have covered most of the questions uh, um, request paresh to kind of help me if i have left out anything that is completely un unintentional uh, i'm just scrolling it through <laughs> scrolling through yeah, uh, I, ah okay i think yeah sorry Continue. Yeah, there is one last question which I probably I missed out from Sazina. Can any one of you on entrepreneurs suggest any technology to use fly ash for bricks or any small civil structure like chamber? Um, I'm not sure who's going to take that. Certainly not in my domain. I, I think we should reserve it for a separate. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, connect. Yeah. Yeah, 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 because yes. we don't really have that. Those yeah. experts. Sajina, what there. I would suggest is just write to any one of yeah. us who you think is competent okay. to kind of guide you in that, and uh, okay. we will. Be, uh, yeah. Any one of us would be most more more happy to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that is all about the question session. I'll uh, kind of. Uh, I think there was somewhere I read one question that can your technology be used for irrigation water. Oh, okay, that is about uh, Anushree Malik's uh, question. Uh, I don't know. I had read it earlier. I don't know where. So what we um, if uh, so I'll, uh, so what we are in right now targeting at the field trial is to provide the potable water to uh, household levels, especially rural households, uh, and uh, tap it from uh, tap in uh, groundwater and make it potable. Uh, in terms of salinity uh, and uh, we also plan to kind of add on a UV light so that uh, the biological content is taken care of. So uh, irrigation and industrial, the volumes of water which are involved is, uh, uh, is quite high. So that means the, the, the flow rates and the treatment rates are going to be higher and uh, that is something which is uh, we, we, we definitely would like to see, uh, explore that but right now at the stage uh, of uh, field trial, no, we are not going to. Uh, that's not our uh, focus right now. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you for such a vigorous question answer session. Uh, now we come to the end and uh, certainly thanks to everybody for staying on this long and I, it's my pleasure to give a vote of thanks, propose a vote of thanks. Uh, first and foremost, the participation by all those who have attended this session as well as all our all our previous sessions, posted questions, and some have continued discussions even after sessions over email. Uh, also, like to thank the various expert speakers and panelists from our joint organizing partners, who are also very senior faculty members as well as uh, uh, directors of the NGOs, as well as those invited by them for the sessions. Who covered a range of important topics, projects, and innovations in water and sanitation. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing team members from all our organizing partners, uh, which includes Jaladi from SEPT, Indrajit from IIT Kharagpur, Meghraj from IIT Bombay, Falguni from IIT Gandhinagar, and of course from our own team, Shanti Menon, whom you heard today, and Rahul Upadhyay. Who actually works at IIT GN but worked as core part of our team for the WIN organizing group. Uh, they coordinated outreach, the content, the schedules, the logistics of the webinar. And uh, we also thank WIN Foundation directors for committed support towards our vision to support innovations. So, with that, I come to the end of this uh, session as well as this webinar series. Thank you all. And we hope to see you again. We also hope to continue dialogue with you in whichever form 